The Lord be with you. Hello there, my dear ones, and welcome to the weekly vlog. What a blessing it is to have you with me as we are approaching 15,000 subscribers on this channel. What a great growing community this is of conservative, traditionalist Christians of many different denominations coming together because we're sick to the back teeth, aren't we, of all of the woke, liberal, lefty, progressive garbage that goes on in churches. Well, if you're new to this channel, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. Welcome to the team. Uh, every week in the weekly vlog, I sit down with you guys and we chew through the major stories from the Christian and Anglican world to try and decipher these things through the worldview of the Holy Bible and Orthodox Christian theology. And this week we have some big stories, especially coming out of the Church of England's General Synod, which has been meeting in York. Uh, they alternate between London and York a couple of times a year. This time it's the Northern Province's turn. And we've had some exciting and frankly bewildering news coming out. So the first story we've got is from the Times. Uh, what's happened is that the news in March of the Church of England's desire to spend one billion pounds, let that incredible amount sink into your head, a billion pounds, uh, to address historical financial links to slavery in the form of paying reparations to whom and really for what is, you know, up for debate. Uh, but it is definitely virtue signaling. It's going along with the woke progressive agenda of the leftist culture in which we are in. Uh, the church has gone along with that in the Church of England and is going to spend a huge chunk of the church's resources on this. Now, the backlash in parishes uh, has been, as has been reported to the Synod uh, this couple of last couple of days, is that they're looking at losing... 100 million pounds from parish shares. Now, if you don't know how the Church of England system works, every parish pays a certain uh, amount of money called a share. Uh, there's some other terms for it sometimes, depends on the diocese. Basically, it's your parish tax to pay the salary for your vicar, your stipend, if you have one, if you have a vicar. If you're blessed enough these days, uh, often it'll be one vicar between, you know, upwards of five or six different parishes. Some other places and dioceses that are in more rapid decline have one vicar between 20 churches in things called mission or minster communities, uh, which are just sort of ways to amalgamate churches so that the decline is mitigated and controlled as much as possible. Well, people have been getting very sick of giving money to the Church of England for a long while because ministry on the ground is very thin uh, and a lot of people are very sick of theological compromise. But it seems that the suggestion of spending a billion quid, <laughs> uh, where they had that laying around, I don't know, on reparations for the slave trade over 250 years ago has really left a bad taste in the mouth of the mum and dad parishioners on the pews. And it is, in fact, I think, going to lead to the further decline of the C of E. Just this week, I sat across a table uh, with three different people over tea and bickies as they came to talk about joining Emmanuel Church. And those three separate people were all from different Church of England parishes, uh, all about a half an hour to 45 minutes away from us here in Morecambe. And they were just disenfranchised with the C of E and fed up with them, seemingly just splurging money on these woke vanity projects. Lo and behold, though, the C of E has hit back and has claimed at this synod that, no, no, we're not actually spending the parishioners' money on this. You know, this is what you put in the plate isn't going to go to these reparations. Uh, that's from some other pot of money. What other pot of money? Where are you sitting on a billion quid? Talk about earthly riches. Look how God has blessed the Mother Church of Anglicanism. And instead of using that blessing and stewarding it well to, oh, I don't know, care for the poor, feed the hungry, evangelize the lost, uh, for basically, you know, evangelism and charity. What do they do? Just throw it, throw it away into an abyss. Uh, it, it's, it's mental. It's insane. I mean, what has happened to the once great Church of England? Well, my church warden, Michael, uh, seems to think that the reprobate mind has taken over. They can't think straight anymore. Uh, because they've been handed over as a form of judgment to very bad leaders, which is often how God judges uh, organizations or even nations. He gives them bad leaders uh, as, as a form of the receding tide of common grace to punish 
people. Maybe because the Church of England has consistently chosen error since the ordination of women 30 years ago, culminating in the living and lust and fornication blessings, then perhaps this is why God is quite cross and he is uh, pulling back from the Church of England. In more money wasting revealed from the Church of England, the Church Times have reported that 5.2 million quid is going to be issued and spread around between 114 churches. Now, maybe this is going to be for evangelism, for mission, for ministry, paying some salaries. Maybe they could get some youth workers out of this. No, no, beloved. It's so that these churches, which are the highest carbon-emitting churches in, in England, can reach net zero. And in lockstep, in lockstep with the globalist agenda, without even questioning it, almost as though they are just the ministry of religion to the government, the C of E has decided, when are they going to try and reach net zero for their parishes by? Oh, I know, 2030. (sighs) Remember, they're building back better. I'll tell you what, I used to be a C of E parish priest, and I was a vicar in some very deeply rural areas with some very wonderful godly people. And you know what? Rural parishes in particular do not need to go green and be net zero. Do you know what they need? They need their boilers fixed. They need their damaged floorboards replaced. They need their leaky roofs patched. They need their organs tuned and refurbished. They need to pay for a vicar uh, and have actual on-the-ground ministry instead of a -a dial-a-vicar system in one of these mission community uh, amalgamations of 20 or 30 parishes that are being pushed across many dioceses. I've got a bit quiet on that lately, but that's definitely still the plan from as far as I can tell. Manage decline, manage decline. And it seems to me, to be frank, badly managed decline. And it's a tragedy because I don't harp on the Church of England because I don't like them or I hate them. I hate what it's become. It's become backslidden to the point that it's barely recognizable as the mother church of global Anglicanism anymore. But I love Anglicanism. I love the Church of England. And I still count it as one of the greatest blessings, honors, and privileges of my life that as an Anglican ordained in one of the former colonies of the British Empire, I was so thankful to God that I was able to move to Britain and partake in this mission God sent me on, and my family as well. My beautiful wife shares the same vision to revive uh, churches. And by God's grace... We've now landed in the Free Church of England and are leading uh, an amazing revival. Um, You'll hear more about that at the the update at the end of the video. But God is very, very, very serious about how Christians are to live their lives and how churches, and particularly church leaders, are to conduct themselves. And I do not think these people have uh, really an ounce of the fear of God in them. Uh, To be wasting the money which God has given them uh, on such foolish projects is an incredulous travesty, really. Uh, And and I think there's so much, frankly, garbage that comes out of the C of E these days that we get used to it. You know, we just think, oh, wow, here's another thing. But really, this is very bad, very bad. Um, If you are in York and you are a member of General Synod, I know some of you watch this channel, uh, You can go to a biblically faithful Anglican church this Sunday. Uh, Tomorrow, you can head off to uh, the Ascombe Bryan Village Hall at 11 a.m. for the York Anglican Church Eucharist service. Uh, It is a faithful safe safe harbor for all Orthodox Anglicans in the York area, and they would love to meet you. And even if you're not a member of General Synod, if you are simply a faithful Christian or a faithful Anglican who's looking around your parish, looking at your diocese and thinking, my goodness gracious, the loony bin is being run by the patients and you want to get out, head over to York Anglican Church. It's part of my denomination, the Free Church of England slash Reformed Episcopal Church UK. And it is pastored by the incredibly brave, faithful and tenacious Reverend Matthew Firth. So, if you want some real biblical Anglicanism, get up, uh, get out of bed tomorrow morning if you live in the York area and get to York Anglican. Okie dokie. More stories out of the C of E now. Uh, The chief bishop in charge of safeguarding, uh, well, Bishop Et, 
uh, Joanne Grenfell has uh, commented on the John Smythe review, which is being independently investigated. Uh, the Apparently the Chief Bishop of Safeguarding and the, the, the National Safeguarding Team are frustrated because the Smythe review continues to be kicked, uh, delayed, the can is being kicked down the road, which is very, very sad to see. She doesn't actually seem to give any reasons why that would be. She does empathize with the families who are waiting some sort of resolution to this as the investigation has taken years upon years. And simultaneous to this, on the same day, there was an update from Keith Macon, the independent reviewer into the Smythe abuse case. I'm not going to go back into the detestable and demonic abuse of Smythe that will make your skin crawl. It's been covered formally on this channel and elsewhere uh, as well. Uh, but Mr. Macon has come out and said that he is still progressing through his investigation uh, and that he is in the representations process that is ongoing. There doesn't seem to be any explanation given, um, but apparently the date of the publication for the report will be decided by Archbishop's Council. So it's basically a TBA to be announced. Well, I'm afraid to say that's not good enough. That is a joke of, of safeguarding. And it, it's pathetic, especially given the bone-chilling abuse perpetrated by Smythe. Uh, and I think the reason they keep delaying this is because they know prominent heads will roll. In fact, there were some very, very uh, dramatic comments made on uh, Anglican Twitter this week uh, in relation to the Smythe case, which really rattled quite a few cages. Whether or not those uh, facts are verifiable is another question, so I'm not going to cover them on, on this channel, um, you, you know, because I prefer to cover things which are from reputable news sources. But I will just simply say, uh, you know, the time is really well past the due date for this to be sorted, isn't it? It's beyond a joke now. In fact, it just looks corrupt by the fact that they've taken so long and are still delaying. It looks dodgy. It looks very dodgy. Okay, more Church of England news. It's like the Church of England Bonanza episode. Uh, Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, a uh, notoriously heterodox gentleman, uh, has uh, hit out in a pastoral letter. We used to call them ad clarums when I was in Melbourne Diocese. I think it's a much better word for it. Uh, he has uh, decided to uh, lash out at this group called the Alliance. This is the sort of motley crew uh, which have banded together to oppose same-sex blessings. Problem is, the motley crew is made up of people who are theologically opposed to each other on other issues. So they're not going to really stay together long. Um, they don't have a lot of doctrinal purity. There's, there's egalitarians and complementarians and Anglo-Catholics have not really touched it. The society has backed off a bit issuing a very milk toast uh, com uh, comment on the whole affair. Uh, church societies in the Alliance, CEC as well, the, the Evangelical Council. So you've got some groups that are uh, very, very traditionalist and faithful and frankly quite based. Uh, and then you've got other groups which are calling themselves traditionalists or evangelicals, but are very compromised. You've even got some women's clergy groups in there, which is a great oxymoron because the same herd and hermeneutic that justifies female ordination is used by the, the ultra-revisionists to justify same-sex marriage and blessings in churches. Anyway, uh, Bishop Croft has decided that he's had enough of these people and issued this, this letter. I won't post all of it here, but uh, it's, it's a few pages long. I think it's four or five pages long. And he basically goes on a bit of a rant uh, all about how um, there's not going to be a third province. Don't get your hopes up. The idea of a third province is, for those who aren't familiar with Church of England polity, there are two provinces in England, the province of Canterbury uh, and the province of York, which are historical. They go back a thousand years or more. And um, the, uh, rev the people who are traditionalists who don't want to bless sodomy and be involved in uh, calling good evil and evil good uh, and don't want to be heretics, have said, hey, we want a third province. And this idea has been floating around, bandied about for a while now. And, you know, it kind of keeps people staying in the pews. It keeps people uh, tagging along. Um, and it keeps the church sort of quasi-united for now. It, it, it avoids, for the time being, <clears throat> the schism or the seismic split which will come. 
if uh, they continue to push with the gay marriage things. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, you know, these alliance folks have been hoping that there would be a third province. They're never going to give it to you because they hold all the cards. They, the heretics have taken over. The wolves are in charge of the hen house. So what they want is a complete takeover. They're just playing nice with you now because they know that they don't have the numbers, the power, or the authority. There'd be too much pushback. But they have already gone and approved things like, oh, I don't know, my, my favorite bugbear, women's ordination. They've already gone and approved rebaptisms for transgender individuals, which is completely against the instructions of the creed for one baptism for the remission of sins. Uh, they've gone and now approved blessings for same-sex couples in existing services. They're pushing for standalone services, which are marriage in name only. They're gaslighting you by saying the doctrine's not changing, but you know the practice is, and by le- the, the rule of lex orandi, lex credendi, it, it, as we worship, so we believe. If you change the practice, you change the doctrine. It's a mess. It's a hot mess. It's a dumpster fire. Anyone with good sense would get out. I appreciate my brothers who stay and fight. I do. I feel for you. I pray for you. But my heart breaks for you because I do feel like you're fighting a losing battle. Maybe I'm a pessimist. Maybe it's all going to turn around. Maybe I'm wrong. But are we willing to go so far back and backtrack so far as we obliterate errors that are very deeply held and are considered by most people in the Church of England now to be completely normative and acceptable, even though they are totally contrary to uh, 1900 years of Christian tradition, <laughs> women's ordination. I don't think we're willing to do that, are we? So you're still going to be compromised and hold out below the waterline. One of the great things I love about my denomination is we have not accepted any of these doctrinal changes from the last hundred years or so. We have remained true to the traditional foundational uh, core of biblical Anglicanism. Our, our Christian orthodoxy comes from the scripture and it comes from our formularies, uh, the BCP, the 39 articles, the, our own declaration of principles. And that gives me great peace, a sleep easy at night, knowing that we are not going to go down the path the CV e has gone down. Um, and I think that's why so many people find us very interesting and intriguing, because according to popular wisdom, especially of our detractors, uh, particularly those who are still in the C of E, uh, and those who have abandoned biblical truth, traditionalist churches, which are unapologetically conservative in their theology, apparently can't, won't grow. They don't make good church plans. And yet, here we are seeing churches growing all over the place uh, in the FCE because we're not budging. We're not budging uh, because people are looking for churches that are still true to God's word. So uh, Bishop Croft has shown the hand, his hand of the House of Bishops. They have no intention to give those remaining conservative traditionalists in the C of E uh, any third province. It's never going to come. I'm just calling it now. It's not going to happen. And be careful, beloved, uh, who are staying to fight that you don't sell your soul along the way of waiting for the third province, the carrot on the stick of the bishops. And goodness knows what machinations they are up to while they lead you along. Okay, next story. Uh, This one, oh, sorry, it's linked to this one, Anglican Futures, which is uh, a great webpage if you're interested in all things C of E and uh, continuing Anglicanism and GAFCON, uh, run by uh, the Leafs, Uh, who are good godly folk, Uh, they have reported on a question by Ian Paul in relation to living in love and faith. Uh, And this is all tied into that discussion I just just had about the third province. Uh, And of course, the lead bishop for this is Martin Snow from the uh, Diocese of Leicester. And and his response to this question by Dr. Ian Paul, who's a leading voice against same-sex marriage, was, I'm not sure that the House doesn't acknowledge the existence of those who cannot agree to disagree. So those folks who are out there in the Church of England who just cannot agree to disagree over same-sex marriage. They can't just say, oh, live and let live, you you do your gay blessings. No, they say, no, this is a red line, we've got to stop this. I think it is a question rather more in of, of an understanding, I guess, that there are people for whom it is very, very deeply held in terms of their conviction. But then a following question of what do we do with that? 
My desire is that such people should have a place within the Church of England. Um, but inevitably, if that's to be the case, there will have to be some shift from an understanding that says we cannot simply agree to disagree. So, of course, the progressives always want the conservatives, the traditionalists, to change. That's their game. That's how they get in. That's how they spread their false doctrine like gangrene. So that's what we're trying to do with the current motion, to create something which I hope will allow as many people as possible to stay within the Church of England. If there are those who feel this really doesn't work, then there's not a lot I can do about that. And a lot of people are reading between the lines of that statement and Bishop Croft's previous statements to say, you know, put up or shut up, don't whinge about LLF, Uh, agree to disagree or get out. And hey, that's what I did. I was my conviction was I couldn't stay in a church which was approving of blessing sin uh, and I probably should have got out long before I did over other compromises but at least it hadn't gone into full blown uh, apostasy of blessing that which God says is wicked uh, of trying to assume that we could correct God and his word so uh, I'm very thankful to God for escaping and I do pray many more follow suit okay Next story is a Roman Catholic story, uh, which is centering upon Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, who is very, very popular among traditionalist Roman Catholics, particularly Latin Mass Catholics. Uh, He is the kind of fella who did not back down. He is fully into tradition. He detested any attempt to modernize the Roman Catholic Church, and he was very vocal as ambassador to the United States in criticizing Pope Francis. Uh, He even went so far as to say that the Pope was a false prophet and a servant of Satan. And interestingly enough, uh, they, uh, in the Vatican, in the halls of power, and undoubtedly the Pope, didn't take too lightly to this. And so they uh, were keen to get him disciplined. Uh, I think he was going to be Very clearly, it was obvious to anyone with eyes to see he was going to be smacked down for this. Um, He was the Vatican's ambassador to the United States between 2011 and 2016, and he actually went into hiding in 2018 uh, because of his comments. Uh, Allegedly, he claims, Pope Francis knew about a U.S. cardinal having sexual misconduct uh, charges against him. But he claims, Vigano claims, the Pope did nothing and the Vatican did nothing about it. The Vatican has vehemently rejected this claim uh, and they have taken him to ecclesial court in absentia um, and the uh, Vatican's doctrinal office ruled that the 83-year-old cardinal must be excommunicated. Um, And so on Friday, that's just what happened. They issued a banishment from the Roman Catholic Church. He can no longer receive the sacraments or... Uh, act as a priest or bishop in the church in any capacity. Uh, This was said to be because he refused to submit to the supreme authority of the pontiff, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope. And this is why I'm a Protestant. (laughs) The guy criticized Pope Francis, and many people uh, would say that uh, his criticisms were quite fair. Uh, And lo and behold, uh, you can't question the Papa or you will be excommunicado. So uh, I think, you know, I'm reminded of <laughs> Lord Acton, who wrote, uh, <laughs> who wrote to a bishop in the 1880s, and he coined the amazingly uh, succinct and poignant phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And isn't that true of the papacy? Uh, unfortunately, when somebody holds ultimate power with very little accountability, Unless they are a person of exemplary character, they will be corrupted by it. They will be tempted into using their power and position and authority uh, to further their own ends or to silence their critics or to attack their enemies or people they perceive to be enemies. Uh, And, you know, I'm all for, I'm, I'm I'm an Anglican, I love the threefold order, I'm all for obeying your bishop in all things canonical and biblical. Absolutely. Uh, And I do think Vigano probably went a little bit far blasting the Pope as a false prophet and a servant of Satan, but certainly he was fair in in having a criticism of the Pope. And I think this is a fairly extreme reaction uh, in an effort to squash any other ultra-traditionalists, particularly Latin mass uh, Catholics, 
uh, who would dare to challenge Francis, who is uh, renowned for being a little bit more on the progressive side uh, than many Catholics would like him to be, although he did make some pretty based comments recently about homosexuality, uh, although maybe some of it's lost in translation and that's not what he actually meant because he does seem fairly progressive, although he plays his cards close to his chest. Uh, and this sort of behavior from the, the pontiff, who, you know, he and the Roman Catholic Church have as yet not recounted the heresies and errors of the Council of Trent, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to upset a lot of Catholic viewers with this, uh, but we can agree to disagree. You be Catholic and I'll be Anglican. Um, but I, I can see the virtue of uh, having a system where bishops, uh, particularly the senior leader of the denomination, has so much m more accountability. Uh, and uh, I think, personally, that um, faithful people and faithful clergy should not be subject to uh, punitive attacks. I'm not saying this is that, it kind of looks a bit that way, um, but they shouldn't be subject to those things uh, at the whim of a bishop. Every bishop is just a deacon in fancy clothes, although they are called to significant leadership and should be honoured and respected as far as they are faithful to the word and are faithful to uh, orthopraxy, that is, godly living. And if they're trying to crush their enemies, then... And that's, that does appear to be what this is, and I think a lot of traditional Catholics will see it this way, then that's not very godly indeed, which is why I think transparency and accountability are so very important. But of course, at the upper echelons of uh, the Roman Catholic system, uh, particularly at the top with the Pope, there really isn't any accountability or transparency, uh, none, none that's really meaningful anyway. So... Uh, Glad to be Anglican, put it that way. Uh, but uh, I do still feel for the traditionalist Roman Catholics because basically what I think is happening is um, to your church, uh, which I still respect greatly because like them or, or, or dislike them, the Roman Catholic Church is still the mother church of most of Western Christianity. Uh, what's happening is what happened to the Anglicans 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's the beginning of the long march through the institution uh, and the capturing of significant positions of power. And uh, I think it's only going to accelerate. Uh, and this really should put pay to the ACNA folks who were talking about merging with Rome. Well, I don't want to merge with Rome, I can tell you that much. Uh, or, well, not merge, that's probably a, a bit of a, a hyperbolic, hyperbolic statement. Uh, having full communion with Rome. Uh, I don't think we Anglicans should pursue that. Because like I said, the uh, divisions in the Reformation have never been healed. And the Roman Catholic Church has dug in and doubled down on those uh, issues repeatedly. So uh, we Anglicans are very quite, quite happy and healthy in the continuing and uh, Gafcon Anglican movement. Should just crack on with our gospel mission and not be distracted by things with this. Although I, I do think even that, 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 that story from last week about a possible full communion between Rome and Gafcon, um, I think that's not going to happen. I think that was just a clickbait article. I don't think that's going to title for get attention. I don't think it's going to happen. Not going to happen. What are your thoughts? Sound off in the comments. Love to know. Okily dokily. Uh, last story. Over 200 Christians have been arrested in the African nation of Eritrea, uh, and many of them are children and women. This is coming uh, uh, as the latest flurry of persecution uh, in this country where uh, over 400 Christians are currently in prison, uh, imprisoned. And frankly, they're imprisoned without trial and indefinitely with no charges. It is just whole scale injustice and they're simply suffering because they believe in Jesus Christ. So please, uh, can you pray for the Christians of Eritrea? And they are in great danger as sometimes they get locked in uh, metal boxes out in the sun until they die as a form of martyrdom which is terrifying and extremely disturbing on every level. So uh, the physical and mental torture that these people go through, including little children, is demonically evil. They need to pray that they are, their, their persecutors are, um, frankly, uh, stopped, put it that way. They either convert or the fear of God falls upon them. The living God puts an end to their, their persecution. 
And uh, we also need to pray um, that this totalitarian dictatorship, which has been uh, running rampant for about 35 or odd years in this country, would come to an end because so many people are suffering here. And it's something you almost never hear about in the mainstream media. So we need to pray uh, earnestly for uh, the, the, the people here who in this country. I mean, I can't even get my head around it. I can't even get my head around the fact that believers would be just arrested for nothing and thrown in prison indefinitely and then executed in the most barbaric and savage ways. Goodness gracious, yeah. We just need to be uh, people of prayer about this and aware about this and giving to um, organizations. I know I say it a lot and I'm going to say it again. Open Doors, Barnabas Aid, they need your money, they need your prayer, they need your support. Okay, update from me. That's the last story. Uh, as many of you who follow my Facebook will know, uh, my it's been a bittersweet uh, fortnight for us. So we made a very big announcement uh, that we are, my wife and I are expecting a third child, a little daughter, uh, who will be born in October. Uh, and she is the fulfillment of uh, nearly 20 years of longing for my wife and I. Uh, we have been wanting a little girl since we met. And uh, for various reasons, um, moving around a lot, uh, huge financial constraints, uh, a lot of stress and bullying and stuff that happened in the past, and also some medical issues, we have been uh, unable to have that baby girl until now. And God has answered our prayers. And so we are about 23 weeks along. So if you could please cover my wife and our baby, our little girl, in your prayers, we'd greatly appreciate it. Now, two sons, Artie and Micah, uh, very, very happy to be big brothers uh, and have already cottoned on that um, by the time she's grown up, uh, they're going to have be, be grown men. And their job is to look after little sister and uh, I think uh, I think one I think it was Micah said uh, that he's going to have to vet any boyfriend she gets when she's a teenager <laughs> so she's she's going to be well cared for uh, so praise be to God for that but it's been a difficult uh, couple of weeks as well because in the midst of that happiness and sharing that publicly finally uh, after some complications in early pregnancy we, we wanted to wait uh, until we shared that uh, Unfortunately, my mum had to go in for some surgery and she came out of the hospital, was doing well, but then tragically she's gone back in um, with some complications and severe infection. So I would really covet your prayers for her. Uh, she's very, very poorly. Um, I'm not getting very many updates from her because she's been uh, taken to hospital again uh, and is very weak. Uh, so I do believe God is a miracle working God. Um, and that he has the power to save. And so please pray for my mum and pray for mum that by God's grace, uh, she would come to know and love Jesus as her saviour and Lord. Okay, an Emmanuel update. I promised you one. Okay, this is exciting because this Sunday marks the celebration of uh, first year since the replant of Emmanuel Church. Uh, and as many of you know, and there's quite a few new people on the channel, uh, I left the Church of England, joined the Free Church of England, and was given the fantastic task of reviving a parish. And we had two parishioners left, and the church had been closed without any worship for uh, about two or three years, I think. And lo and behold, um, the building uh, was a, a wreck. It had been storm damaged, and somehow, by the grace of God, uh, we have worked very hard at it, and we have sought the mercy of the living God, and we have gone from two very faithful folks in their 80s up to 50 regular parishioners. Last Sunday, we had 51 adults in church, and we had 14 kids. It blows my mind. Uh, there are very many challenges in uh, keeping up with that growth, in uh, looking after a building which is still uh, breaking, <laughs> falling apart at the edges, uh, in raising a salary, which is all self-funded, uh, and the contribution of you wonderful folks through this channel actually keeps the lights on and keeps food on my family's table. Uh, and it has been a wonderful 
awesome adventure thus far, and I can't wait for the years ahead. I've said to my bishop and uh, others in our church family who have asked me, uh, people anxious, they don't want me to go anywhere. I'm and my wife, uh, my wife and I are in this for the long haul. We have yearned for and prayed for for many years uh, a church where we could put down roots for the long term. Uh, because it's selfish, we want to be a part of a good church family. Uh, we want our kids raised in a good church family without moving from pillar to post all the time. And this is the very best church I've ever pastored. I've never met or been privileged to know and love very dearly so many mature, faithful, God-fearing, godly Christians. So we are going to um, have our bring and share lunch, our potluck, which we have first Sunday of the month, every month. But this time around, it's a birthday party. It's an anniversary celebration for the first year uh, to give thanks to God for everything he's done, which is awesome. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's once you were not a people, but now you are a people, a royal priest or a holy nation. He really does just form church families out of seemingly nothing. And there are just people out there, and I think and I'm, my mind's just going through all the people in my church now who were wandering lost or who were stuck in heterodox churches or some of whom walk through the doors as atheists and unbelievers and have become, have become born-again Christians uh, through the ministry at Emmanuel. And I am so, so thankful to the Lord. Uh, many people thank me and praise me for this. It's not me. Uh, I am just a guy with a Bible. I'm just a guy with a Bible. And it's God who's done the work. It's God who's grown this church. And I praise him every single day. Uh, and it's just in time for my annual review, which is the week after. So uh, I'm sure that the, I think it's 4,000, no, 2,500% growth <laughs> is, shall make uh, everyone happy. <laughs> I think my friend Sam told me that. He's good at maths. Gone from two to 50 odd is 2,500% growth in a year. That's insane. And, um, you know, God is working marvels. Absolute marvels. Uh, we have our weekly Bible study class, have our men's and women's fellowships. We have our uh, Hebrew class, um, which, oh, that reminds me, that's on hiatus for a moment because our Hebrew professor, uh, retired uh, old Catholic bishop, is um, caring for his wife who's very poorly. So if you could please pray for Ali, uh, that is Bishop David's wife, we would really appreciate it um, and pray for a miracle of healing. Um and we have our kids' ministry. We're about to have a Sunday school. Uh, we have our charity store, and uh, which, which reaches hundreds of people a week with uh, affordable, low-cost items to help them uh, make ends meet. We have our community cafe every Friday, which, again, is flooded weekly by dozens upon dozens of people looking for uh, a chat or friendship, and they get to hear the gospel and meet uh, loving Christians. It is... Just an astonishing thing that God has done in just the space of a year. And I still want to do more, 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 and so do my church family. And sometimes we have to just stop and pinch ourselves and be like, is this real? Wow, it's only been a year. <laughs> we don't want to lose our zeal, but we also have to take a breather and be like, yeah, God is good. We're doing great. Let's just pace ourselves and keep at it. Um, and we have big plans for the future. I've said from the beginning, Emmanuel's going to be a church planting church. And we already have two in the works in the planning and the prayer stage. Uh, and we're just sitting on the idea and praying like mad about them. Uh, because there's no use trying to do anything until we're more established at Emmanuel. But certainly I think we ought to be praying uh, about these things well ahead of time. So thank you to all of you who have been along for the ride. Uh, those of you who have come up and visited Emmanuel, what an honor and a privilege for people to turn up from YouTube. I had two YouTube followers come from uh, Australia, from Armadale on, um, on Friday, which was awesome. Uh, and we had folks come last week from Southport and Maidenhead and all over the place. Uh, and we get people from all over the world. So glory to God. So... Thank you for your prayers. Keeps, please keep praying for us. One thing I can guarantee you is God is growing his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Satan wants to crush Emmanuel Church. He wants to destroy me and he wants to destroy this church. And many, many people at Emmanuel feel this. They feel it in their bones. They discern it in the spirit. We've had words of prophecy about it. Uh, so we would cover your prayers as well for protection from any harm coming to me and my ministry, which is the linchpin that holds Emmanuel together and the Emmanuel Church family, our buildings, our people, our health, our well-being, 
our finances, anything and everything, please cover us in prayer so that the evil one doesn't attack us. And if for our first birthday you would like to give us a donation, you can head to the Just Giving link, which is in the description of this video. Every penny goes to uh, the upkeep of the building, paying my salary and saving up to replace the roof, to replace the broken floors, to replace the busted heating, to fix the uh, tumble down walls, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's still in very bad shape. Uh, we've got it to a, a level where it's holding together, but it desperately needs major works. And we want to make sure there's plenty in the kitty before we step out in faith and do that, uh, rather than being bad stewards. We want to be very good stewards of the gifts that people have given us. Okay, that's the Emmanuel update. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching, my dear ones. Uh, I love the tradition that Father Calvin used to have when he had his Common Sense Crusade on GB News. Uh, I got to read the collect on there once, which was an honor and a privilege. And I tell you what, I want to read this collect for you, the collect prayer for this week. The Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts the love of thy name, increase in us true religion, Nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, my dear ones, I'm going to see you perhaps tomorrow in church for our amazing big birthday lunch. You're most welcome to attend, or on the live stream of worship, or in the next video. God bless you and your family and your loved ones, and goodbye.